In the 1700s and 1800s, London was the brewing capital of the world. Here in the old city of London, just a barrel roll away from the docks where beer would have been taken all over the globe, were some of the biggest breweries that have ever existed. We had Truman's to the north, and then we had Barclay Perkins to the south, both at one time the biggest brewery in the world. Back then, all of the breweries would have been focusing on porter, supplying London's pubs with the hoppy, dark and well-aged beers that got their name from being the lifeblood of the porters, the people who ferried around the streets of London delivering goods. But as porters started to decline in popularity and buyouts changed the landscape, they all started to disappear. And now all that's left of the great Victorian porter breweries are road names and memorials. I say all, but I don't mean quite all. You see, nearby Bermondsey has become a hotbed for creative, modern brewing. And one of those breweries is hoping to bring Porter back to the London masses and take on one of the last remaining big dark ale brewers. That's Guinness, by the way. We first filmed at Anspach and Hobday and met the founders Jack and Paul way back in 2013 at the opening of their brewery on Druid Street in Bermondsey. They opened with a core range that included a smoked brown and an award-winning porter, which was an unusual prospect. Just as brewers were becoming obsessed with super modern styles, this brewery was equally interested in tradition. We've watched them grow and modernise, including an expansion to East Croydon, but their beers have always had one eye on the past, whether it's a lager or a new version of London's own historic style, the Porter, which is why we're visiting today. What started as just a lockdown idea has become the brewery's biggest beer, a session strength version of their Porter, given a modern edge with new techniques and of course, that classic smooth Guinness pour. But don't make the mistake of thinking this is just a homage to that Dublin beer muff though. This is its own beer, showing London's history, the brewery's character and Porter's unique flavour. This is London Black. Essentially, being a brewery that started very much with a focus on, on dark beers, there was always the obvious question of when are we going to try something with nitro? So, so it's been on the cards for a long time. So it's kind of interesting that nobody, given the history um, of porter uh, and dark beers in London, it's kind of interesting that nobody's really tried to push that. We've just sort of let you know, Guinness have those taps. Why do you think it's taken a while for a London brewery to really go for it? There haven't been anyone who's pushing that as their main beer. There may have been some others doing nitro style stouts to take on Guinness, but it was sort of a second thing. And I don't think that's been their hero beer or anyone else's, whereas I think what we've been able to create in, in over lockdown is something which people are going to love. So it is your hero beer? It's becoming that, yeah. It, it feels, uh, in a sense, like after, you know, we're sort of eight years in now, but we finally have this, this one kind of thing that we can really, really push behind that gives us a real kind of laser focus. I mean, obviously we love making the variety of beers that we always have done, but to have one beer that we can, as brewers as well, really focus on brew it again and again and again and really, really get it down with a very clear target of what we want it to be has been, um, has been really kind of uh, mobilizing for all of us here, I think. We became well known for a porter at 6.7% which is an outstanding and fantastic beer, but it's not everyone's drinking beer every day. And I think at the same time, it, it, when you say to people, oh, we make a porter, that's what we're known for, say, oh, is that a bit like a Guinness? I think also our sort of um, development as a brewery around dark beers maps really nicely onto that of London as a, as a brewing uh, capital, as it were. You know, when London was leading the way and leading the world in brewing, it was, it was dark beers. And obviously that for, for a large part comes down to the water. So it's no surprise that when we were finding our way in home brewing, it was the darker beers that were working best, you know, when we were learning about water treatment and things like that. It's no surprise that the beers that were, were really working for us were the darker beers and the porter in particular. When you then start learning as you, as you learn about all of these things, that that's sort of the story of London, as well as the story of your brewery, it's kind of like a positive feedback loop. What's really nice about what you guys have done, I think, is that you know, most of the brewers that have tried it before have gone for a, a nitro stout. They've gone to almost copy Guinness and try to make you know, a local independent version, which is great. But you guys have gone, no, we're going to go Porter because yeah. that's the, the history in London and because you know, you, you know, obviously you want to compete with Guinness, but you don't want to be the same. You want to offer something new, right? So we've, we've 
danced around the notion of what the difference between stout and porter is, and I'm sure we'll get into it in, the, in this video. But from a recipe standpoint, can you talk me through, you know, what's in all these sacks yeah, and what absolutely. kind of flavours we're going to get? It loosely starts with our, our porter, um, and the, the main things that from a malt base that um, really define that are the use of uh, amber malt and chocolate malt alongside a base of uh, uh, marisotta. Because we brought the ABV down, we wanted to, to bring the body up a little bit. So we introduced some Munich malt, which brings a nice little bit of sweetness, um, but it never gets kind of like cloying like a crystal malt or anything like that. Um, so that, that kind of, that fills out the, the, the body a little bit. And then in addition to uh, the chocolate malt, we also do use a little bit of roasted barley, which just sort of brings that color up a bit. It's very close to a port's recipe, but you've reused lots of modern, uh, well, or international malts rather to, to bring that kind of flavor together. So lots of heritage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's about, uh, we, we do some brewing and some porters especially where we'll, we will literally go by a historical text as it were and, and even to, the, to the, the, the mashing methods and things like that. With this and I think with our, the majority of our beers it's got to be balanced, it's got to be drinkable, it's got to kind of work in the right setting. So you know we're very lucky in our industry we have so many different um, tools at our disposal um, we, can, we can get malts from essentially wherever. So it's about finding the right things that are going to work for that specific beer. So I'm super excited to try uh, this beer again, but in particular to try it next to a Guinness. So we've come down to the beautiful Victoria in Deptford because it's one of the few pubs in London that has recognised the difference between Guinness and London Black so much that they serve both over the bar. I don't think it's surprising. I think more places should do that because they might look similar, but they are quite different, right? Absolutely, yeah. So should we start with Guinness? I know you, you're, you're a fan of the Guinness. Tell me about the beer. It's, it's my go-to sort of safety pint. It's a dry stout. It's creamy. It's roasty, um, it's delicious. Mm. So the clue's kind of in the name as well, like it's quite dry. It's almost refreshing, and I know that most people will be going, what? Yeah. But it can be, you know, it's crisp almost in how, how roasty and bitter it is. Somehow it is crisp, yeah, it's yeah. a crisp pint. You kind of, uh, it's easily sinkable. Exactly, and yeah. I think that's kind of the secret to how it's been a dark beer with great success when so many other beers have, have disappeared. Speaking of which, we then move over to the Anspach and Hobday London Black, which is a porter. So it's a different style, although they look, well, not quite identical, right? It's, it's creamier head, right? So I don't know if it's coming out on camera. This is quite a white head. This has got a distinctly sort of richer, creamier look to it. Yeah, definitely a kind of off-white. Off-white, If we were sure. buying some paint. Yes. Um, yeah, and so this is a porter. So the history of porter, actually it predates stout in, in some ways, in that this was the original dark beer. It was brewed in the 17 and 1800s, in, particularly in London breweries. Mm. It's a dark, uh, for the time, it was a very hoppy beer because that's what helped you age it and it was well aged because they used some pretty kind of gnarly roasty malts in there. You'd age out that bitterness and the hops would allow you to do that because hops are a preservative. Nice. But actually in modern times, porters have become sweet, kind of red berry and fruit notes and less of what you'd expect from a Guinness and from a dry stout, which is big roasty coffee burnt toast kind of vibes. Yeah. So let's see if, if they are indeed very different side by side. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Oh. <laughs> it's pretty good, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's got, I feel like it's got much more kind of sweet, sweet depth to it, I guess. Kind of like figs and raisins and things going on. Johnny, I love the Guinness for its simplicity, its reliability, but this, it brings something else to the table. It's dark, it's complex. Um, it's got a richness that I'm not getting from the Guinness. And uh, all of that is not to say that it isn't massively crushable, drinkable. I want more pints of this. 
I'm going to drink it all night. It's a great boozer. Yeah, I, th I think some people are often put off by the intense roastiness mm. of Guinness. And actually this, with a bit more sweetness, kind of like a milk chocolate vibe rather than a yeah. dark chocolate vibe, a less roasty coffee, more like latte mm. Than, mm. than an espresso. Why couldn't this be the Guinness of London? You know, when you go into a London pub, you're craving the London black because that's the porter. It's got the historical connection oh. but it's got the modernity as well and the crushability factor but also the dark and brooding flavors you know i'm very excited about having you know london doesn't currently have a beer style of its own really anymore no this is this is like our home team the <laughs> london team we should all be drinking porter should all be wearing black Man. that's the team color drinking black yes because it's the team drink we have we've picked apart the differences we've highlighted how sensationally good this beer is. We kind of need to spread this message into the world. Exactly, we're gonna go out and meet the good people of London and we're gonna give some pints to some people and see if we can convince them that London Black, the local, the independent, the craft, the delicious, the sweet, the brooding beer is the better choice. Too many adjectives? It's good to be back with you guys. Where Absolutely. are we going to head to to change some minds? Well, um, I thought we could just pop in here to begin with the, the English restaurant. Uh, one of the first accounts that took on London Black and just a, a beautiful traditional English pub restaurant. Lovely setting and great oysters. Alrighty, let's give it a go. I think the the, the general idea here was they get a lot of people asking for you know this type of beer. Um, but they didn't want to work with, you know, a macro brewery. They, it's about independence and heritage and uh, provenance and stuff like that. So uh, for them, it, it's, it was an obvious choice when we kind of came along with London Black. So um, yeah, one of, the, one of the first adopters and just a fantastic setting for the beer, I think. Mm. It's quite rare, sorry, restaurants, to care about the provenance of their drinks. You know, the wine will come from all over the world. The beers yeah. will probably come from some microbrewery where they can get a price and a good margin. Whereas here they've gone, you know what? There's a local producer of a local style, yeah. a style invented. I mean, we're literally yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's meters the, it's the away from the old Truman Brewery, where, where one of the biggest porter breweries in the world, so. So we've been talking quite a lot about heritage in this video already. And, and one thing that always came along with the porters was the oyster. Mm. So I don't know whether you knew about this, but in the, in the 1850s, half a billion oysters were sold and shucked within London. Wow. The place must have been littered. Maybe that's where the, the oyster stout came from. They just needed somewhere to put Something it. Something to do with the shells. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But so, but, I mean, porters, uh, sorry, oysters back then were street food, essentially one of the early sort of forms of street food. You could yeah, just nice. buy it on the street. Um, and the porters that were drinking this kind of beer would have also been uh, reaching for oysters as well. And while I don't think any, any of the brewers sort of necessarily brewed a beer perhaps to go with oysters, it seems kind of natural that they go together and it's kind of a historic match, isn't it? Charles Dickens wrote that poverty... <laughs> this is great. <laughs> poverty and oysters often went together. Johnny did some Wikipedia just before we, we started filming. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I don't Beautiful. know whether oysters will ever become street food again. But yeah, I mean, I, I feel like oysters and porter and oysters and stout as well, they're one of those matches that everyone says is classic and historical and nobody actually really does it because when do you yeah. get the opportunity to come and sit down with oysters and with a delicious porter? Like, this is quite a rare occurrence. I applaud yeah, yeah, you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah for bringing this together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, do you clink them? I, th I think we can clink oysters. All right, cheers. Uh, and have a sip of beer as well with it. Just give it a little help on that. That's a good oyster. That is a delicious oyster. And what's really great is because it's so salty mm. and so meaty, and then this is even sweeter by comparison afterwards. It's really yeah. nice how it changes yeah, nice. the beer and makes it feel Yeah. Um, like, like it's home. Trust. Exactly, like it. There you go. <laughs> like I said, I'm sure that's how the oyster felt. Yeah. Um, but the beer definitely <laughs> does. Um, that is absolutely delicious. So we're going to line our stomach with oysters, the traditional way of preparing for a, an evening of drinking, um, and head to see if we can persuade uh, some beer geeks that London Black deserves uh, its place on the bar, either next to or instead of. 
Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. That beer. With our stomachs suitably full, we headed off down Brick Lane, past Truman's and up the Roman Road to one of London's original and best craft beer bars, Mother Kelly's, to hand out some pints and get feedback from the city's beer geeks. Can I get you a beer? But you've got to be on camera and just tell us if you like it. You will like it because it's a great beer. Yes. Awesome. Oh, it's been a while since I've done this. All right, lads, I come bearing gifts. Fantastic. Let's uh, just pop them down here. Whoops. Oh, it's delicious. Aren't they? Delicious. Yeah, yeah really nice. nice. Oh, really what do you reckon? Great. Yeah, really good. Quite stunning. Really good. Little chocolatey, nutty flavours, mate. Very nice. Nice, nice. So you were already drinking? I was, the London Black. I was, because it, it's a really tasty beer. It is, right? It's gorgeous. But, uh, what, I mean, I look at that. It's, it's a beautiful a, pint. It's a gorgeous looking pint. Yeah. And uh, the only thing that's missing is the little pigeon <laughs> stand <laughs> on top, because you've got to make it your own. Exactly. Don't, you don't want people mistaking it for Guinness. No, 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 no. Once you try it, there's no mistaking it for Guinness. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a much smoother. Uh, slightly sweeter, not as roasty. No. I think it's a much more sessionable beer. Well, let's give it a go. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Man. All right. Hi. <laughs> so, a bit weird, but... Thank you. So, this is London Black. And it's it's a kind of like uh, it's Hans Batch and Hub Day's answer to Guinness. Also, it's got like a nice roasted flavour backstage. Yeah. Feel is more chocolatey. Yeah. As well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I like. It's got it's kind of like a bit of a kind of dark fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going on as well. Do you have one of these before? No, first time actually. First time. Wow. Okay. Cool. I like it. I, uh, it. It's got a nice body to it as well. So, uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, Why are we drinking Guinness in London? Well, you could be drinking a London porter. A London style porter in London. It's gorgeous. This is a London porter. Wow. So it's kind of a little bit less roasty toasty, a little bit sweeter. You've got a sweet tooth. Yeah. You're getting really descriptive and you haven't got the beer yet. He's not, he's not even pouring my beer. It's slow. <laughs> you gotta wait. You gotta finish some today's you wait. I need to go back to my date, but um, You do? Yeah. Go back to your date. Let me know, honest opinion. It was I actually no, I like it. Wait, you run a podcast? I do run a podcast. Tell me about it. Well I'm one half of Rhythm and Blues alongside my compadre Luke. Nice. Where we uh, match beer with music. Wow, okay. Two of my favourite things in life. Exactly. I'm not sure if our sample was quite big enough for this claim, but to me, it's clear that Guinness drinkers and beer geeks, at least those of East London, are open to the switch. Hey, have a great night! For our part though, it's just heartening not only to have a vital bit of London's brewing heritage back, but a nitro dark ale made by a small and independent brewery. However far it can go, it's something we've been waiting for for a decade, pretty much since Antbatch and Hobday opened up. <laughs>